Well, you know, usually I'll begin this show with a monologue. Hi, everybody. I'm Marky e. Bilson, your voice of choice for a new generation of Tri-City sports fans. But I wanted to own the Tri-Cities like we always do here on 1420 NBC Sports Radio Tri-Cities on the opening day of the Appalachian League with someone who I think is one of my favorite people that I've ever been associated with in the Appalachian League. We talked to him last year. He is, uh, you can relive that interview on YouTube if you so desire, but I'm talking about Julio Cruz, and a lot of people of a certain generation will remember when Julio Cruz was number one in your hearts, or number six on the back, but number one on your hearts. Yeah. Or you'll remember his uh, outstanding base-stealing abilities. What you might not know, he was an outstanding manager in the Appalachian League, winning Manager of the Year honors for the Pulaski Rangers back in 1997. Since then, he's been a broadcaster now for his old team, the Seattle Mariners, and I just love talking to him. I think he's, uh, I, I, I gotta tell you, I loved how you managed the Rangers. I was a broadcaster in the Appalachian League at the time. Back then, of course, now they're the Pulaski Yankees and such, but, uh, I want to, I want to ask here a little bit. When you are putting together your team, as a manager at this time, it's a whole new circumstance. Maybe you have a few stats uh, from last year in, in the developmental leagues or what they did in college, but you're trying to put together a team and order a staff. Right now for a manager, what are the challenges? How do you put together a baseball team of unknowns? Because I know it's been some time, Julio Cruz, but you did it once and you did it very well. And I will tell you, I mean, you say the older players, I believe five guys on that team made the major leagues. But uh, wow. something else I wanted to ask, though, is I remember talking to you way back then, and you had a very hands-off managerial philosophy that I really loved. It was letting the players play. And I, I remembered uh, that, you know, you would, for instance, I'd say, well, what kind of pitch count do you have on your starter? And he said, and you'd say something like, really, I don't really have one because in the majors, they've got to be able to learn to go nine. Uh, do you think that that philosophy, though, I mean, uh, you know, today we might see a, a, ba a major league team have one complete game all year or something like yeah. that. Do you think that that philosophy, I mean, you could still manage the same way if you got a job in the minors? Oh, Mar Marky, the game has totally changed. Now it's five and dive. Five innings and get out. But you have your stopper, you have your setup, man. You have, uh, you, you, you have eight guys before you go with go into your closer and it's, just, it's, it's a whole new different way of pitching it's a, uh, a pitch count they only let the kid go 40 50 60 pitches at the most uh which is which you know rattles me uh, i played with a uh, uh tom Seaver and sure and when he got to about 40 or 50 pitches I'd be darned if you went out there and got him. He was he was going for a complete game all the time, and his philosophy was you have to go nine. You have to be, prepare yourself to go nine, not not five. Why do you think that is? Do you think it might be a product of changing rules? I mean, I know that when you played for the Mariners or the White Sox, the DH rule was already in effect. 
But at one right. time, I, I but uh, it's always been said that the DH required, you know, maximum effort. You couldn't really pitch around or say take an effort, uh, a, uh, a take it easy on a pitcher. And to tell you the truth, when I see a 96 mile an hour fastball thrown to a pitcher, <laughs> when I'm watching a National League game, I do kind of ask Julio Cruz, why is he doing that? He's just burning himself out. He doesn't know how to pitch. Uh, let me ask, have we lost something? I mean, is there still pitching in baseball today, or is it all about throwing? I, I see that and all that. Do, do you, um, what can stop that? Because you need, I think, to have a full, effective pitcher. Uh, someone like, and I'll use the example with the Giants, Madison Bumgarner, because he's perhaps the only pitcher left, I think, that you could say, this guy could go nine. A couple of years ago, he threw 10 complete games, for instance. And uh, I, I wanted to ask, I mean, just, you know, what can be done, though, now to say, okay, here's pitching uh you know I, i'm told that hitters you know they'll work the count more these days or, or, or what i don't know if anybody's done actual statistics finding out you know if players are working the count today in 2018 more than they did in i don't know 1978 or 1938 but uh you know th that's what said is there anything that can be done to go back and say look this is how you don't burn yourself out I mean, you know, if somebody did a shift, the shift isn't anything new. Lou Berdeau did it with Ted Williams. And I mean, I'll be admit Ted that it's, Williams, right. I, I'll admit it's now more in vogue than it was, uh, you know, over uh, the in past years. But, you know, it has been done in the past. And I'm just curious, you know, why doesn't anybody do what seems to be the obvious thing? I mean, we're talking about making you know, more rules. Uh, you can only put so many people on one side of the infield or whatever. But I'm like, look, why can't anybody lay down a bunt? I think you get a double for crying out loud if you laid down a bunt. What, you're around the big league game now. Why doesn't anybody have that mentality? No, 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 no one. They don't see them themselves on ESPN if you bunt. You want to go, you, you want to go deep, you want to hit. Hit the ball with, with now you got velocity, you got art, you got, you got all these different things when you hit the ball. So, you know, when you bunt, when you bunt, uh, there's no, uh, there's no, uh, how do you want to say? There's, the there's no, nothing to it. There's, there's just, just, if you watch them, I, I was watching them in practice. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't front. They don't front at all that practice. Now, now come game time, in the fifth, sixth, seventh inning, they're asked to bunt, and they don't bunt. They can't bunt. I am... They're trying to, they're trying to, uh, they're trying to go deep all the time to watch themselves on ESPN. And Julio 
Julio Cruz, when you played in the 70s and 80s, I mean, when you took batting practice, wasn't it like standard that the first couple of times you were just going to lay down a bunt, just to, you knew yeah. that the earth, and then you'd go out and, you know, if you were a power hitter, maybe you'd try to put on a show or whatever, you yeah. know, or, or work on, you know, your, your, what you needed to, uh, eh, geez, I think I have a hitch in my swing. Let me see, you know, try to, right. you know, that sort of thing, what batting practice is supposed to be. So, and, and I'll admit that I haven't probably gone to a major league game to watch batting practice since Mark McGuire was in the league to, you know, see the show there. But you're telling me that if I uh, went to a major league batting practice today, uh, everyone's trying to put on a show that idea of, uh, hey, lay the first two down, one uh, the left side, one the right. That's not being done today. No, it, it, it's being done, but they're not, they're not doing it successfully. Ooh. You know, Maybe a handful of guys might put it down to the right side and then put it down to the left side and then go ahead and take batting practice. But uh, you, don't, you don't see it. And it, it's frustrating. Uh, I know it's frustrating for me in, in the seventh inning, and I'm, 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 I'm visualizing and then saying on the radio, okay, the butt's on now. And uh, they, they, they follow it off. They, they try it one time, follow off, and then that's it. And they try to, then they try to hit ground ball, and then they, what they do is they, they hit a ground ball to the shortstop or second baseman, third baseman, double play, and you're out of the inning. What? I, you know, we're talking about changes in baseball. One of the things I did like about your managing style back when you were the manager of the Pulaski Rangers, and again, he was the manager of the year, the Rangers had the best record in the uh, Appalachian League that year. And the only reason I remember last year you telling me that uh, you got out of managing and into broadcasting was there was an illness in the family and yeah. you needed to take care of the relative. And as such, then it became kind of like out of sight, out of mind. And this is how broadcasting came became your ticket back into the major leagues. Uh, but one, one of the things I was impressed was, like I said, letting the players play. I, I remember one game specifically where uh, you allowed a 157 hitter to bat in the ninth inning in Johnson City in a close game, and he came up with the game-winning hit. I think it was Frank Haramelo. Uh, yeah, Frank Haramelo. Yeah, and uh, I know you remember that player, but I think it was Frank Haramelo. And just, you know, allowing a 157 hitter to bat in that situation, yeah. it, it was, hey, look, this is where you're supposed to learn. You know, you'll and, and, and you know, and that was kind of what the Appalachian League was all about. Where twenty-one years later, some idiot sports talk show host would remember that uh, more than probably who won the game. Uh, but anyway, I, I just uh, was looking at this now. Uh, if you were going to try to make a comeback in managing, because you were a successful one, what changes do you think you would have to make if, say, the Mariners came to you and said, yeah, I did a good job. Could you pilot one of these teams, just in theory? what, what, How different do you think you'd have to pilot your team? Well, first of all, I would have to get along with 25 different personalities. That would be the first thing. Uh, these guys, they're all as you know, Monkey, they're all different. They're all built differently. And uh, I would have to uh, be a teacher, uh, a psychiatrist. I, I just, I, cause the game has completely, you know, just changed. Mm -hmm. and I would have to just learn to, to treat each guy individually. Uh, and learn their talent and take it from there. So more of a personal communication, and I see that. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, because they're all, they're all, you know, these guys are all, gosh darn it, they're all so different now. You know that they, it, it, it's, it's all like it's all individual. And I, I see that because I know that managers like, say, Boone or Cora or even Kapler in uh, Philadelphia are kind of hired a lot of times because of their personality. They think they'll get along with the players and not so right. much because right. of their strategy because they don't have any uh, real managing uh, experience uh, in the minors. 
Yeah, so I, I do see that. And, and you know, that, that, ha that was done back in the day, too. I mean, you did have personable managers like Tommy Lasorda or Chuck Tanner. And I remember last year you telling me about uh, Tony LaRusso certainly had, you know, a, a lot of energy. And I mean, a lot of, you know, I mean, he's, I, I could recall him going into the booth of uh, one baseball broadcast. And that's not the way I managed, you know, to try to correct them live on the air, you know, and all this. But no, there was that uh, feeling that players manager, it wasn't always, let's say, who is a tough guy? Dick Williams. You know, it wasn't always Dick a guy Williams. like that uh, yeah. and, and such. I, I, I want to, though, ask one different change in baseball. And I guess that we hear about this a lot. And I want to see if you can remember this, because uh, we hear a lot about the third time through the order. You know, that's when you can really get to a starting pitcher. Uh, yeah. I'm a little skeptical because the stats I've seen are like eight points of on base percentage, but still that's the philosophy. We saw it with Rich Hill in a world series. When you played, you played against the Oakland days of 1980 who threw 94 complete games. You played against the Chicago white Sox of La Russa when you were with the Man Mariners, who were known to have a strong staff, Tom Seaver, you mentioned, but not so much of a bullpen. They were expected to go nine in that era. When you were playing, was there sort of a feeling of, well, you know what? I think I can get him that third time around. W was that something that you actually looked forward to as a player? No, not really, Marky. I, I don't really recall that. I recall playing, you know, the first the ninth inning. I never thought of, uh, of waiting till the third time around. I was I was taught get them the first time, you know, score early, try to get them out of try to get into the bullpen early instead of waiting around the third time. You know, by that time uh, he's all warmed up. And he might be throwing a no no. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. <laughs> I, I want to continue with uh, Julio Cruz, and I, I we, uh, thank you for joining me here. I've always enjoyed talking to you. I mean, back yeah. in your days. And also, I'd say you mentioned your per, your uh, personability of, of the team and handling the personalities. I do remember what a good clubhouse you had. Uh, for instance, one, your pitching coach was Lee Tunnel. I once brought in a scorecard of a game as a kid I attended that Lee Tunnel pitched, and the wow. entire team wanted to go see, you know, I mean, this was, and you could see the bonding that your team had when they all wanted to look at the scorecard and they all, you, you know, really crowded around it and all this. Lee Tunnel, of course, wanted to know what he did at, at the plate. That was kind of interesting. But uh, yeah. no, um, I, I want to go and talk, though, about the Mariners. To me, they might be the surprise team of baseball this year. I know it's been a long time since 2001, since they made the playoffs. It's the longest drought in baseball right now. Uh, maybe there aren't a whole lot of Mariners fans in Tennessee, but, you know, they are quite a story. What's been the key for the Seattle Mariners this year up in the Emerald City? Pete Gordon. Okay. Yep. He came in and changed, changed the whole dynamic of this, uh, of the, this lineup uh, by, uh, by Stephen Bases, uh, and now by moving over to second base. Uh, the managing has been... He's been great. Uh, Scott Service has been doing a great job uh, with the bullpen. Mel Spalmeyer, the pitching coach, they have a good pitch. They have a good uh, a good staff, good coaching staff, and they know the the bullpen knows who's going to pitch and when, and they're all uh, they're all like take care of each other. Which is great uh, uh, to see a game and know that the, a one-run game for the Mariners is going to be on the Mariners' side. Uh, you know, they what, it's 22 games, uh, one-run rate games, and that leaves the major leagues in, in uh, you know, mm -hmm. scoring, scoring one run and winning by one run. 22 games, that's a lot of games. 
to be winning by one run. So uh, I hope they can uh, uh, sustain that. When you win all those games by one run, I love that because you go through the game and someone like me can say, boy, that was a good strategic move. Yeah, or, 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 if you're, or if you're watching a long keeping score like I like to do, uh, you know, so you can see this opening day of the Appalachian League baseball season. I've got my favorite Appalachian League manager from back in the day, 1997 Pulaski Rangers, now a Mariners broadcaster. But I got to ask, the Mariners are the one team... Uh, I guess it's the longest drought uh, since making the World Series. Back when you played, wow. 1977, and uh, it's, you know, 41 years. They've won 116 games in a season, but never won, uh, been to the Fall Classic. What makes you think this might be the year where that streak ends? What What makes you think that the Mariners could be that team that can defeat those great pitching staffs or the Yankees and the Red Sox and all those victories this year in the playoffs. Well, the way they the way they play their their uh, late inning games, uh, Marky, it's 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 their late inning game situation that uh, uh, is going to take them up to the top. But also, we have to watch out for Houston. Yeah, with all that staff, they, I mean, yeah. They, Houston, Houston, they never lose, you know. And if they have lost in the last eleven games, if they have lost maybe one or two games, uh, Seattle would have been in, in a great situation now going to uh, New York and Boston. But Houston doesn't lose. And if they don't lose, you know, who's going who's gonna, to who's gonna top them? Where are the Mariners going to go? But you still have the wild card, yeah, yeah. They, yeah. If that's the case, but then again, twelve game winning streak. Eventually, it will end. Well, although it could go on indefinitely, certainly with that staff that the Astros have here. We've been talking to Julio Cruz. Like I said, uh, I, I just thought a tremendous manager back in the day with the Pulaski Rangers. Now he's a tremendous broadcaster with the Seattle Mariners. And they've been the surprise team of the American League. So uh, a team to uh, keep an eye on. And I love the fact that it's the strategy. It's these close win games and all this that they have been winning. And uh, you can talk about talent, but we all like to think about the thinking man's part of the game. And uh, as he says, that's uh, the way the Mariners have done it. I got to take a break. Caleb Calhoun of All for Tennessee will get us up to date on the Vols. Could Steve Forbes actually coach Tennessee one day? I'll talk about it with Caleb Calhoun in the next half hour.